anarchy, right? No. Just another night in Big 12 basketball. This is Locked On Big 12. You are Locked On Big 12, your daily podcast on the Big 12 Conference. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Happy Wednesday, everybody. Welcome into Locked On Big 12. I'm Drake Toll from ESPN Central Texas. Thank you for making Locked On Big 12 your first listen every single day. Some clerical stuff. Yes, today is my birthday. The rumors are true, and that is why this entire week has been thrown for a loop content-wise. The Big 2-3, Jordan year. Also, I'm on location at a new job. Yeah. How fun is that? The only hint I can give you as to what it is, is the fur coat in the background. Am I still hosting Locked On Big 12? Yeah, for the rest of my life. Your best bet, the Dose Grande, is not going anywhere, especially for how electric basketball is. The Big 12 should have 12 teams in March Madness. I have said that before. I'll say it again, and I'm starting to believe it. They should also have more than just eight teams ranked. That's too low. I know it's a record, but it's too low. Look at Kansas State. Why is Kansas State not ranked? 68-64 win over Baylor. Kansas get the win over Oklahoma State proves once again, 90 to 66 in Stillwater. Once again, a change has to be made. I like Mike Boynton. Nice guy. Has to go. Cincinnati beating TCU. Again, Cincinnati could very well at 13 and 4 be ranked. Iowa State loses to BYU 72, 82 to 72, 87, 87 to 87 to 72 BYU proving that, Hey, you can die by the three. Sometimes I made the case in the show of how they die by the three and how do they try to find offense somewhere else in this game? When I give you the stats later on, you're going to see, huh? BYU won the game because they made way more threes than Iowa state. Let's start with Baylor and Kansas state though. This one was nuts. 68, 64. The final Kansas state wins it. Hello. Baylor didn't want to win this game, but neither did Kansas State. Both teams tried. Baylor's Ray J. Dennis goes two for 15. He was awful to watch play basketball. Pretty much everybody on the floor for Baylor was awful to watch play basketball. 18% from three. 33% from the just shooting the ball field goal percentage. Free throw percentage, 47%. Nine for 19. That is bad. They lose the rebound battle. That is bad. They lose the steal battle. That is bad. They lose the... They lose... The points battle, 68-64, and it loses them the game. They go to overtime, though. Kansas State tried to give this game away. Baylor tried to give this game away. Neither team wanted to win. Who has the more nails at the very end? It's the Kansas State Wildcats. It looked like in overtime, this game was trending toward Baylor's direction, but Jerome Tang outlasts Drew, Scott Drew once again. 17 for 22 for Kansas State from the free throw line. 7 for 23 from 3 is not great, but 22 for 54 from field goal range. In a game where your opponent is terrible is just good enough. Guess what? Watching this game, I was not impressed with Tyler Perry. Watching other games, I have been impressed with Tyler Perry. Even when he has an off night, the fact that Kansas State can win against a top 10 team proves Kansas State should be ranked. Also, the the crowd control or whoever, whatever you want to call them, they didn't let Kansas State rush to the floor. I know Jerome Tank's thing is act like you've been there before. Let's do the Wabash Cannonball and everything. No, 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 no. Let's still rush the floor. You beat a top 10 team as an unranked team at home. Let the kids have fun, Jerome. You and I, Jerome Tang was the first guy that I hugged after Baylor won a Big 12 championship in 2022. Two? Yeah, he's the first guy that I hugged. Him and I, he, him, I, I have appreciated Jerome Tang more than anybody else in that basketball program when I was at Baylor. Jerome, me to you, man. Let him rush the court. Kansas over Oklahoma State. Can, uh, uh, do we need to? Kansas is number three in the nation. They're good at basketball. 90 to 66. Oklahoma State, not number three in the nation. Not good at basketball. Mike Boynton has had one of the best moments I've seen in a basketball game in the Big 12. He gets thrown out of a game like three years ago in Waco. Walks over after he gets thrown out. Walks to Scott Drew. Shakes his hand. Thanks him. Goes to the locker room. Mike Boynton, you're a legend. You're also probably out of a job after this season. I wish it would have worked out. It did not. That's that's all I have. That That is my rundown of Oklahoma State and Kansas from last night. How about TCU and Cincinnati? Uh, can we get in close? Get in close. Everybody get in close. Can we be honest with ourselves? Right here? Can, we, can I say something controversial? Cincinnati is a March Madness team. Cincinnati is a March Madness team. They are a tournament team this season. I, Dady Thomas... Day, day, all day was nuts last night in watching this game at a split screen, Cincinnati, uh, Cincinnati and and TCU going to overtime, watching the end of that one as a lot of these other big 12 games tipped off was 
I was floored at the intensity that Cincinnati plays with, and they win in overtime. Look, I'm still impressed with TCU. I think they're a top ten, a top 25 team and not top 10. And I don't think they should drop out of the top 25 just because of this road loss, which is a quad one road loss. Instead, rank Cincinnati, rank Kansas State. You cowards do the right thing and put as many Big 12 teams as possible in the rankings. There could be 11 Big 12 teams, 11 Big 12 teams ranked and 11 Big 12 teams to vie for a tournament spot. There's BYU and Iowa State. Uh, remember that time I said BYU can't live and die by the three that doesn't work in the Big 12? Can I tell you something again? Can I get close again? Can I get close again? Iowa State, according to shot quality, is the number one Big 12 team. Number one Big 12 team defensively. Overall defensively, number one in the conference. BYU put up 87 points, draining the three ball. Iowa State only shot 14 threes, made four of them. BYU shot 35 threes. They made 13 of them. 37% is not elite. No, but in a game where both teams shot about the same amount of free throws, where Iowa State had more shots than BYU, and BYU shot just a little bit better than the Cyclones, 3% better. The main difference, the 15-point difference here, comes from the fact that BYU made 13 threes, Iowa State made four. Also, BYU had a better shooting percentage from the free throw line. That was a big help. Rebounding, BYU had two more than Iowa State, a lot more assists. The ball movement was much better, and they only turned the ball over I say only 11 times is pretty good in a Big 12 basketball game, especially But Iowa State turned over 13 times. The disparities in these statistics are not bad until you really look at the three-pointers. BYU, especially at home, dangerous animal because they can knock down the three. They are. I'm gonna, can I say it? Can I say it? The most dangerous shooting team in the Big 12 right now. For that, keep BYU ranked. Keep Iowa State ranked because it's the Big 12. Most of the time, the road team is going to lose in this conference. That's just kind of the way it goes. Unless you're playing Oklahoma State or West Virginia, then you have no excuse. Look at it, you, Texas. So right now, there are 10 teams in the Big 12 that I think firmly, firmly are in March Madness. Kansas, Baylor, those are those unspoken. Kansas State, TCU, Cincinnati, Iowa State, BYU. Give me Oklahoma. Texas Tech and Houston. As for Texas, UCF, West Virginia, and especially Oklahoma State, you got to prove a little bit more. Oklahoma State, West Virginia, you're out of contention. UCF, you could be. Texas, you could be. But for now, I don't believe in Texas. And I still am not sold on UCF after that home loss to BYU. Otherwise, there are 10 Big 12 teams that will, that will make March Madness. And if Texas and UCF can somehow put it together, there's a path. There's a path for 12 Big 12 teams. The Big 12, truly a Big 12 teams in March Madness from this conference. That's crazy and possible. Coming up, is Utah really that good? Can we select Utah as the as a Big 12 champion of football next season? Already in our way too early, does it have to be Utah? Because they have that 10% of fans that just are stinkers. This is Locked On Big 12, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, today's show brought to you by LinkedIn. LinkedIn Talent Solutions is where I go. When I need a good birthday present, I go to LinkedIn Talent Solutions because they give me a new hire. I'm looking, look, I told you I'm on the road right now. I'm balancing a lot of stuff from social media to posting shows. I need some help with that. So I hire an intern all the time. Every semester I hire an intern. I go to LinkedIn Talent Solutions to do it. The purple hashtag hiring frame. They're not just another job board. They help you find quality candidates faster. Small businesses rate LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus the leading competitors. LinkedIn also knows what small businesses are wearing wearing so many hats and might not have the time or resources to hire. Thankfully, with LinkedIn, the process is intuitive, quick, easy. Post your job free. LinkedIn.com slash locked on college. LinkedIn.com slash locked on college. Keep in mind, terms and conditions do apply. Utah is getting a lot of love in the preseason awards. And I'm not, it's not just by me just randomly saying this team is going to be a top 25 team. It's people smarter than me. Because for those of you who are just listening on podcasts, I just noticed that I said Utah football top 25, top 25 in 2025, basically in our little show rundown graphics. So I apologize for that gaffe. But people smarter than me at Bleacher Report, ESPN, and the Athletic Stuart Mandel all have Utah listed inside the top 15 for way too early 2024. I think it's absolutely fair for a lot of the reasons we've discussed. Cam Rising, the tight end depth, an elite staple of running backs, even when you lose Jaquindon Jackson, an offensive line that still returns three starters. Yes, the receiver position is a question mark, but look around college football. A lot of other teams have big questions 
question marks too. The defense, the front seven, yes, you lose your best pass rusher, but you are well equipped to replace him. All three of your best linebackers are back. And while the secondary, you need to retool it, Utah's done exactly that in the transfer portal and attacked it well. Factor in the Kyle Winningham consistently factor. And I think Utah absolutely deserves their ranking in these way too early top 25 lists in 2024. Can I make you a little sad and then happy? <laughs> sure. You've done, but yeah, you do both usually. So yeah. Utah lost five games in 2023, four games in 22, four games in 21 en route to Pac-12 championships. In 2019, they lost three games. This is a program that does lose ball games. They lose multiple ball games. That's what Kyle Whittingham has done. However, they still find a freaking way to win in the postseason. That postseason being Pac-12 championships at this point. Not and bowl games. Not, not bowl, bowl games. games. We know that. <laughs> not bowl games. But the Pac-12 championship. To me, Utah mm-hmm. seems like the perfect embodiment of this. Everybody hold on to your seats. The Utah Utes go 9-3. and three. Maybe 10-2. and two. And I, I, what you're hearing right now, you're going, well, that doesn't sound like a top 10 team. But wait, partner. That is good enough in this Big 12 to get you to the Big 12 championship. And then all you have to do is win to go to the college football playoff. The champion of the Big 12 gets in no matter what. And that is where Utah will wreak havoc. And you'll go, huh, remember that year Utah had three losses and won the national championship? Because that's just kind of what Utah does. Right? Right? You think like, oh, they lost enough game. They're probably, they lost enough game. They're probably, they're not going to win the Pac-12 championship this year. You know, maybe. And then somehow the chips fall perfectly in Utah's favor and they win. I have them at number one on my way too early. 2024 power rankings. Kansas at two. Arizona at three. West Virginia a lot back at four. Iowa State at five. Now, these are way too early. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do that most people aren't going to do. ESPN, CBS, those guys, they're not going to tweak that in a week. Mine's going to change by next Monday. Mine's going to change by uh, two Mondays from now, right? As I monitor the transfer portal, who's in, who's out. And also, I'm going to look deeper than just, oh, Utah's 11th in the Big 12 in transfer portal rankings. They don't have to be top five. Mm -hmm. Cincinnati needs to be. They need a roster overhaul to compete in the Big 12. Utah doesn't. There are some teams at the bottom of the power rankings when it comes to transfer portal that need to be. There's positive attrition. Oh, five guys left. They probably didn't need to be there anyway. And then you bring in the pieces that you need. Utah's in a place where they are good enough for that problem to happen, to not be a top five transfer portal team in the conference. They shouldn't be because they're such a sturdy program. Utah at number one, the defense is good enough. I think the defense will end up being the best in the Big 12 because the returning p- returning players, and as long as it's not injury Mageddon again, Utah is in a great spot in the Big 12 next year, especially with Cam rising at the helm. That was well, fantastically said. And I said, "Hey, you, you like I said, you've done a lot of goodwill today. I think Utah fans will be loving on you." I always do goodwill. It's the one thing they're going to hear one thing, and then they're, oh, I can't believe you said that. Oh, I'm done listening, and then and they, they drown out that I like Utah. Now, unfortunately, you might lose some Big Twelve listeners because I did notice that you are drinking from an Arkansas cup on this podcast. Yeah, I got to ouch, ouch I'm, a, the I'm a Southwest Conference guy. <laughs> I'm a big Southwest Conference fan. I, I spread the love. <laughs> You know, but I absolutely agree with everything you were saying about Utah. And I think the one thing, too, is like we said, if you look at Utah, I could be like, hey, they need to fill some things in the secondary. They could use a receiver. The offensive line was a little shaky at the end. But yeah, yeah. this is the but we could do that with every single college football team. Even oh, look, and, and can, can I be honest? I'm not, I'm not even using the cases for why Utah is going to lose two or three games. I, it's just yeah. by virtue of what it's what Kyle Whittingham has kind of done. And the schedule is yeah, not true. that it's not even that brutal for Utah. I, I also think it's a combination of Kyle Whittingham has lost two or three games. That's just what happens. Number two, the Big 12 is going to be nuts, man. It's going to be nuts. It is going to be crazy. <laughs> I could see Colorado. Oh, they're going to kill me. I could see Colorado going four and eight with one of those wins being against Utah. I don't know if they. I can see. Well, I, I can see Colorado going better than four and eight. Actually, I'm. I'm. I'm a little. I mean, they got the best quarterback in the conference to me. As I, much as I love Cam. Also true. I just think that there's that level of parity in the conference that Utah could go eleven and one and still lose to a five and seven team. Don't scream at yeah. me. It's just what happens here. Welcome to the Big Twelve.
Well, especially when that, like you said, that one win team is the guy who's, as of this moment, the first overall pick in the 2025 NFL draft. A lot has to happen between them, but that's how good Shador Sanders is. So, True. yeah, I think there's a lot that's going to happen. It's going to be really interesting to see. I love the position that Utah's in. They need to do a couple more things to tweak, but with how much returning talent they have and how much talent they still have from a team that won a conference championship, which yeah. is something not a lot of teams in college football can say in general they right did now. Just, it's like a weird little, uh, little like, they just froze. They froze that know, conference they championship <laughs> team in time. Like, nobody move. Everybody's getting hurt. We're all coming back. We're getting the band back yeah. together after a year. I love it. Let's just, it's kind of like the 2020 season. That was such a weird one for Utah in yeah. general. But like, if you look at the it's Jake five Bentley, games, it's, right? It's five games, COVID, it just didn't work. Like it was a mess. It was a disaster. But then if you like freeze that and go, man, the Tyler Huntley to Cam Rising transition was, was pretty nice. Now you skip over the part where it was Jake Bentley and your former guy, Charlie Brewer too. Yeah, was, Don't forget Charlie Brewer. Oh, trust me. Utah fans are not unable to. It was my, uh, my first ever Utah BYU rivalry game. I went there and saw uh, Charlie Brewer. And BYU his, uh, fans love Charlie Brewer. Yeah, I'm sure. They <laughs> Today's show. Welcome back. Is brought to you by FanDuel. FanDuel is where I go to bat. I, I love to bat. I love to, Wager money to say that I think X team is going to win X game, and I usually am on the money. FanDuel.com, 150 bucks right now in bonus bets, win or lose, when you put down a $5 bet. $5 bet, anything. On a basketball game tonight, on Texas versus UCF, $5 bet, get 150 in bonus bets. Same game parlays. Best bets in the new sports app. Make a parlay in the parlay hub and more. FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make your first bet a layup. FanDuel official sports partner of the NFL. Today's show is also brought to you by our friends at Jace Medical. Jace Medical can help save your life. That is true. Right now, there is a shortage across the country of medicine, antibiotics. That's right. Scary thing. And you don't want to be scared. You want peace of mind in a time where there's a shortage of medicine across the country. I can't imagine feeling more helpless and being sick and not being able to fix it. Thankfully, it'll be okay. Jace Medical's got us five different antibiotics in a Jace case, respiratory infections, UTIs, Sinsuit, <clears throat> sinusitis, skin infections, among others. This stuff could happen to any of us. JaceMedical.com, complete your physician encounter. It'll be reviewed by a board certified physician, and your medications will be dispensed by a local pharmacy or licensed pharmacy. It's never been more important to be prepared than it is today. You go to JaceMedical.com, use offer code locked on to get $20 off your order. KJ Jefferson as a transfer. Yeah. I mean, it has to be the biggest news. I don't think that's something that just affects UCF per se, but all of the uh, uh, contests that are upcoming, UCF facing Florida, um, it, it, Shador Sanders and company coming here to uh, Orlando, Arizona coming to town, all that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to just make this UCF centric, but you mentioned two teams, actually. You mentioned in passing two Arizona looking good. First of all, kind of tell the people who haven't seen that YouTube yet, what it is that you see um, in UCF being sneaky good. And then talk to me a little bit about Arizona too, but let's start with UCF here. We'll start with UCF. I, I am, and this might shock you, I like Gus Malazan, the old Arkansas high school football coach at Shiloh Christian. That's what I know him from. And he goes to Arkansas as the OC under Houston. Not, I called that play. I mean, there's the lore. Look, I brought my Arkansas cup today. I did because hey. the lore, of of one Gus Malzahn is so big in the state of Arkansas and that's the program that wanted to hire him for so long then he goes to Auburn wins a national championship as the OC as we all know he is the quasi head coach of that program it was not Gene Chizik Gene proved that and was eventually fired then he goes back to Auburn and he was Nick Saban's kryptonite he was the one guy that could trip up Nick Saban and, and now at UCF, what he has needed is consistency, not from the university, but from the uh, environment around UCF. What conference are we in? What players do we have? How do we settle into the Big 12, moving up into the Power Five? And he did it so well in year one that they were the lone team to make a bowl game out of the new additions to the Big 12. Did they win the bowl game? No, we don't have to get into that. That was just an ugly, gross game. But they, they moved it to a bowl, which was better than anybody else. They got added to the Big 12, and then they added K.J. Jefferson. And I think a couple of UCF fans rolled their eyes and thought, ah, you know, this old Arkansas quarterback who was really good to start his career, and then uh, by the end of his career, what are we really getting? And you know why I think that? He's a three-star on 24-7, which I believe. I truly, I, this is not me trying to blow hot air up your skirt. He is 
one of the most dangerous quarterbacks in the Big 12 in the country. And the reason you didn't see that toward the end of his career, I watched a lot of K.J. Jefferson, a Valonia, Arkansas resident myself growing up. I watched a lot of K.J. Jefferson and he didn't want to be there. That program at Arkansas is so lackluster. They fired their OC in the middle of the season. You watch KJ and think, does he even want to play right now? But he could never. The offense was not conducive with his style of play, and it was easy to shut down when every other player on the field was doing it. That being said, KJ Jefferson was not being recruited by Dartmouth. He is not a student of the game. He is a pure, spectacular athlete. That what he brings to Auburn, what he brings... What he brings to UCF with old Auburn coach Gus Malzahn is something that I don't know if Big 12 defenses are necessarily ready for. He's a different, I watched him live in that Kansas Bowl game. When they played Kansas in the Liberty Bowl, if you're not excited about KJ Jefferson, pull up those highlights. He's a one-man football team. He just creates. And when he has a team and an organization and a program and a coach behind him that suits his game, he's going to go nuts. And no, you listen, you make a lot of great points. And I think the biggest knock that I find credible – Um, of Gus Malzahn is he spends too much time trying to use quarterbacks as if they were Cam Newton. Yeah. I'll say this. And I asked a coach about it at the, uh, at the presser I was at yesterday uh, as we record this. um, And he had this to say about uh, KJ Jefferson's physical tools. What tools does he bring? What has he seen that makes you unique? Um, He's compared to the other guys. He's an NFL quarterback. He's got all the physical tools. I mean, he's he's a big time runner. There's no doubt about that. Uh, He throws a deep ball as good as anybody in the country. Really what stands out to me is that he can extend plays. Uh, You know, his, He's strong in the pocket. Uh, he escapes, and once he escapes, he has his eyes down the field, and uh, he can make plays when things break down. And you know, when, in college football, when you start playing the top teams, I mean, the quarterback's got to make plays. You got your system, and all that. But he has shown time and time again against some of the best defenses, in, you know, the country, um, you know, all of college football that he's played extremely well. You know, in those moments. And kind of follow up on that quick coach, durability, you got to feel good about that with his size as well. Uh, 100%. Cool tools does he bring? What has he seen that makes you? Now, keep in mind that little quick follow up isn't just something by a fat guy wearing a tie, me. Uh, but listen, Dylan Gabriel out due yeah. to injury. Um, uh, uh, RJ, or, RJ Harvey. No, that's the running back, Kyle. Uh, John Rice Plumley twice yeah. shortened on the season because he was trying to run around and do a little too much. The difference is when I look at John Rice Plumley, I can tell there's a potential for a dual athlete to play baseball. One, he's wildly handsome. Two, he's yeah. the size of a baseball player. KJ Jefferson being in the room with him has linebacker shoulders. And, yes. and listen, I, I'll add this. I don't mean to go uh, clip crazy here, but this one built right into the other. I asked him about his philosophy on contact for a quarterback. What tools does he bring? What has he seen that makes you? Uh, like you said, dishing out punch. I mean, uh, a lot of guys don't like hitting big quarterbacks or big guys, period. So I try to use that to my advantage. Uh, try to just kind of lean on them because, I mean, they'll get tired before I get tired. So that's my, my that's my philosophy just going into it. Uh, I don't shy away from contact, but I, I will be smart. I mean, I won't just make a dumb decision and put my put my body at risk and to have me sit down a couple games. So I do want to be smart in the hits that I do take and the hits that I do give out. So. So the desire to the swagger to tell me he wants to fish out punishment and then the intelligence to say, I want to control what I'm doing. Now, that's either an overall good view of, hey, this is uh, I've seen what happened to you guys with John Rice. You ain't got to worry about that or at least the awareness because he was in the room when I asked coach about durability to, hey, hey, listen, fat man in a tie. It's okay. I'm going to be smart. One of the two shows intelligence and swagger, and I liked it. So I, I, I just wanted to add those in. I think that, Nate, take home your point on K.J. Jefferson. We see too many quarterbacks in college football that throw their body around. They don't use their size strategically. They think, I don't need to slide. I'll just run into said linebacker, and it will somehow work out. It usually doesn't, or they're penalty hunting. For K.J. Jefferson, <clears throat> six foot three, 250 pounds. That is a dump truck. That When that comes at you at linebacker, you're getting out of the way. He doesn't need to slide. And what's wild, too, is how crafty he is with his feet. I wouldn't call him fast. I would call him agile 
and quick. In short spaces, he can make lateral movements and he can get past you. I don't see him breaking off a run for 95 yards. But what I do see is him getting around you for 95 yards. K.J. Jefferson is, uh, I, I, again, again, I've watched this kid play enough that, yes, he only put up three points against Mississippi State, but he brought his team right there on the cusp of beating Alabama. He beat Texas. He was so good. If you could harness that in the beautiful city that is Orlando, make the kid happy. That's that's what it is. Today in college football, there is gratification needed for players to play at their best. That's just the way it is. You give him that, he's going to be good. Well, and I don't know if you noticed him wearing his kingdom polo, so the collective has done their part in it. Uh, with that in mind, also over Give the kid a bag. Give it to him. You say it as if it's forthcoming. I think it might be past tense at this yeah, point. Yeah, yeah. Gave the kid a bag. But the uh, but the two other things he mentioned, too, Darren Hinshaw, the offensive coordinator, mm. uh, made a great difference in a single year with John Rice Plumley to add touch. I think this will be a great specimen for Henshaw to do that again. And something that I don't have here in the clips uh, and, and forgive me, I'll show my credentials for my uh, Aaron Evans, original painting there of me as an offensive lineman. You would think I would have included this quote, but he also threw props at the offensive line there at UCF. But you mean they're just a team that went from the G five to the power five. How could they have an offensive line? They good. Well, Hey, trust me. The problem was the run defense. We mentioned that bowl game. We don't need to build into that right now. But uh, I think all the above makes sense. Um, and, and just having he says he wants to shine as a passer, probably has NFL aspirations. You heard Malzahn call him an NFL quarterback, all that. And by the way, while Javon Baker uh, has gone to the NFL uh, uh, draft, I, I know that was a point you made in your YouTube piece. Xavier Townsend, I think, will be a plenty talented guy to step in and be that number two receiver across from Kobe Hudson. So weapons uh, are, are fine. I, I think we're good um, there as well. Wasn't that an invigorating conversation about KG Jefferson? I think he's going to be good. I think he's going to be good. You'll see. We'll all see. This has been It Always Will Be. Come back tomorrow. We'll talk more football and basketball. We've got to recap some basketball games today. Have a birthday. Locked on. Thanks for making your first listen every single day. No se grande.